So hello everyone and welcome to the Science and Literature webinar series on health, well-being and literature. Today's speaker is Dr. Michael Greeny. Dr. Greeny is Senior Lecturer in the Department of English Literature and Creative Writing at Lancaster University, UK. His research focuses on fiction from 1800 to the present and he has written a number of monographs, the most recent of which is an AZ of Jane Austen with Bloomsbury in 2022. And the title of his talk today is Imagining Illness in Jane Austen. Welcome to the webinar, Dr. Greeny. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to begin by uh, saying thank you very much indeed to Aria for the invitation to speak to you today and to all of you for, for joining me for what's going to be a talk of between 20 and 30 minutes, quite an informal talk, which is going to take um, its cue from my recent book, which in a spirit of shameless self-promotion, I've put there on my first slide, an eighty set of Jane Austen, 26 chapters about Jane Austen, 26 keywords. Uh, and in this book, I is for illness. So I have this chapter on illness in Austen, but this, um, this talk is me just kind of thinking a bit further about what Austen does with illness. Um, now, my guess is that Austen is probably a writer who needs perhaps no introduction, but, but I thought there'd be no harm in a very quick refresher. So, so Austen, as you'll know, a enormously celebrated Georgian uh, novelist, best known for her six full-length completed novels from Northanger Abbey uh, through to Persuasion. Uh, and some of the some of the key qualities, some of the defining qualities of her style, I guess, and her character as a novelist, one is that she she is a purveyor of broadly realistic romantic comedies. So by realistic, I mean that if something happens in a Jane Austen novel, you can perhaps imagine something broadly comparable happening in everyday life. Uh, and they are romances, they deal with flirtation, courtship, and they end uh, in marriage. She's not a writer of extremes, uh, and I mean that in, in, in at least two different ways, that, that she doesn't go to social extremes, <clears throat> she doesn't tend to focus on the royalty or the aristocracy at the top of the social ladder, nor does she particularly focus on the poor or the labouring classes. Overwhelmingly, her, her fiction focuses on the lives of respectable landowners, the, 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 the gentry. And I think the other way in which she's not a writer of extremes is you will not find in Austen's novels graphic depictions of uh, physical violence. You will not find anything uh, sexually explicit. And you will have to look quite hard for evidence of death in Austen's novels as well. One thing that Austen is, I'm not going to say unique because you're always disproved, aren't you, in literary studies when you make such sweeping claims, but very distinctive uh, as a novelist is that if you are a character who is alive at the start of an Austen novel, then you are overwhelmingly likely still to be alive at the end of that novel. Try thinking of another novelist of whom that is true. Try thinking of another novelist who has such a good survival rate. There are a couple of minor characters who die in the course of Austen novels. Everyone else makes it through uh, in one piece. Uh, and she's a problem-solving writer. So she's a problem-solving writer. Things go wrong in Austen novels. There are misunderstandings, there are dilemmas, and there are setbacks, but they go wrong typically so that they can go right at the end, so that they can things can be resolved and problems can be addressed and you can arrive at these kind of satisfying conclusions which tend to be crowned by the marriage uh, of the hero and the heroine. Now I'm drawing all of these particular qualities to your attention because I think what we have here is I think the basis of some of the reasons why some readers have deemed Austin to be a writer who is pretty squeamishly detached from the human body. Uh, she is problem solving, she's tidy minded. She's not a writer of extreme, so we're not going to get anything grisly or visceral or any kind of ringside seat at or face to face confrontation with uh, death or, or serious uh, fatal or terminal illness. So there is this perception that she is perhaps happiest as a kind of writer of abstraction. She would rather be writing about, think again about those titles, about 
persuasion or prejudice, these slightly abstract and disembodied notions rather than the visceral reality of the human body. Now, that's a, a perception or, or a reputation, I think, that Austin has, which is really quite persistent. Uh, and, and one way in which I can illustrate what I mean by that is to quote you some words from the, the critic Claire Jarvis. So this is, this is Claire Jarvis from not so long ago who says this. Uh, I will apologise in advance for the, uh, uh, the, the, the coarse language here. Uh, Austin's characters sometimes blush, but they never sweat or eat or fuck. They're always thin, minimal homunculi with which Austin's narrator played out her fictions. Constellations of fine eyes and pink cheeks, patterns written in blank, inhuman space, made legible as people through the narrator's willful world making alone. Um, I think that the what Jarvis is saying here is perhaps true to the way we might remember Austin at a distance, that it seems persuasive to say that, yeah, she is interested in people in a perhaps in a slightly disembodied way. But actually, I think that Jarvis's generalizations become less true once you revisit the detail of Austin's writings. Just to give you one example, I said that no one or almost no one dies in Austin, but someone who does die in Austin in Mansfield Park is, is Dr. Grant, who, who pretty much eats himself to death. So anyone who eats himself to death is doing something really quite physical and really quite visceral. So the idea that they that Austin's characters are almost like disembodied ghosts, I think, is, is less true than the more we revisit her writings. And one way in which her characters, I think, are continually re-embodied, one way in which we are continually reminded that these are these are flesh and blood creatures rather than kind of spokesmen and spokeswomen for, for abstract ideas. One of those ways is through Austin's persistent emphasis on illness. So the title of this talk is is, as I said, imagining illness in Austin's, uh, in, in, in Jane Austen. And I want to think in a bit more detail about she, how and why she does like to imagine illness. So this is a quotation from Anne Elliot, the, the, the heroine of Persuasion. And Anne Elliot says that a sick chamber may often furnish the worth of volumes, that the illness can be a very powerful and rich narrative resource. That's what Anne Elliot is saying. I think that Austin broadly agrees with her. It's not that Austin ever writes an entire novel from beginning to end about illness, but rather that there is no Austin novel which is not in some way about illness that does not have an illness episode or an illness uh, narrative. So just to begin with Northanger Abbey, Northanger Abbey, uh, a significant part of it is set in the town of Bath. Bath is a health resort. People gravitate to Bath for the good of their health. So we have illness there at the beginning of Austin's novelistic career, uh, in Persuasion, her final novel, where we happen to be back in Bath. And we have a, also we have a character in Persuasion, Louisa Musgrove, who nearly dies. She has a horrible fall, she has a concussion, and there is an illness narrative that becomes very significant in that text. So illness provides, doesn't fill entire Austin volumes, but it provides her with a continual, a continual source of material and inspiration. And this is true as well of Austin's critics. Um, so this is just a sample of what is an increasingly large bibliography, you could say, of critics who've written on themes of health and illness in Austin. So just some references there to relevant work in the field by Anita Gorman, Nora Bartlett, John Mullen, uh, and John Wiltshire. Um, just thinking a bit more about why Austin is so repeatedly drawn to illness as, as, as kind of narrative subject matter, uh, I think there are there are a number of different answers to that question, some of which I would itemise as follows. Um, illness is a source of problems and crises. So Austin likes to write about people who are pretty comfortable uh, and pretty privileged. Uh, so how can we introduce uncertainty in their lives? One of those ways in which Austin likes to introduce uncertainty is a degree of financial uncertainty, or there can be romantic uncertainty, but we can add illness to the list there. Illness is something that is perhaps unpredictable and perhaps uncontrollable. So no, no matter how privileged your life is, illness can shake things up for you. So illness could be bad for you in other words, but it can be good for the storyline. Uh, and I think illness is, is the source of different kinds of uncertainty uh, in Austin. So one kind of uncertainty is how will it turn out? 
So um, when Marion Dashwood in Sense and Sensibility is, is seriously ill with fever, in that novel, there are times when we genuinely don't know if she's going to live or die. And she, I think, is the Austin character of all the characters is in her six main novels. Mar Marianne Dashwood is the one who I think comes closest to death. She does survive, but, but it's, it's touch and go. So that's what I, I, I would call medical uncertainty. And you don't quite know how, how a, a certain illness is going to turn out. But the other kind of uncertainty that Austin is very intrigued by is the question of whether illness or what claims to be illness is act can actually be counted as illness. Because there are a lot of hypochondriacs, there are a lot of exaggerators and there are a lot of fantasists in the world of, of Austin. One, one very interesting example would be Mrs Churchill who's a minor uh, sort of peripheral character in Emma. A lot of what we hear about Mrs Churchill is about how she's always ill but also what we hear about is a lot of skepticism about whether she is actually as ill as she claims to be. So that I guess we can call hermeneutic uncertainty. How do we interpret the truth or otherwise of certain uh, diagnostic claims. Um, the experience of illness in Austin, I, I, we, I think we can describe as a narrative that interrupts other narratives. So there is always a love story in Austin, but that love story doesn't always flow smoothly and is interrupted by other kinds of narrative. And one, I think, powerful example of this, and I've mentioned her already, Louisa Musgrove in Persuasion, she thinks she's the heroine of a love story. She thinks that she is going to be getting together with Captain Wentworth. The novel has other ideas and she becomes, rather than the heroine of a love story, the heroine of an illness narrative when she's recovering from her very serious injuries from her fall at the seaside. And that's something that I think Austin likes to do a lot, is to weave together love stories with other forms of narrative. And um, finally, I, I think in illness, in Austin, illness is a way of measuring the power and privileges of the unwell person. Um, the moment when you're ill is a moment when you can take stock of what resources you have to look after yourself. Do you have access to medical care? Can you, for example, go to Bath and take the waters? Ill, everyone gets ill. Illness is arguably a universal experience, but I think there is a, a kind of hierarchy of experiences of illness, and Austin often focuses on illness as it is experienced, and sometimes almost perversely enjoyed by slightly more affluent and well-heeled people. Um, I also wanted to say, this is a kind of postscript, I think, to, to this list of comments about the significance of illness in Austin, which is I guess illness, the concept of illness only makes sense in contradistinction to the concept of health. So every time Austin invites us to think about illness, she's implicitly thinking, asking us to think what counts as health uh, and to what extent. And I think often she, she does seem to do this. She seems to write from the side of health, diagnosing the ills in a more, I guess, figurative sense, the, the figurative ills of society. Um, one thing that Austin, I think, casts a particularly shrewd and satirical eye on, and this is this is something that she does repeatedly, is, is on those who imagine that they are ill, imagining illness. She's fond of imagining people who imagine that they are ill. And that is a, a rogues gallery that, will, that would include Mrs. Churchill and Emma, whom I've already mentioned. There is Mary Musgrove in Persuasion, I think when Mrs. Mrs. Churchill claims to be ill in Emma, it's often about control. It's often about dictating um, where people are and demanding their attention and their presence. With Mary Musgrove and Persuasion, her illness is about, or her, her claims to be ill are often about attention seeking. She wants people to listen to her and to attend to her. She feels neglected and she feels excluded. Uh, and then you have the Parker siblings in Sanderton. Sanderton is an unfinished novel, a fragment of a novel uh, that Austin was working on towards the very end of her life. And in it, that we have three of the Parker siblings who are almost career hyper hypochondriacs. They almost try to outdo each other to see who can be the most ill. And one of them, Diana, is described as being almost as ill as possible, almost as ill as possible. It's almost as though she is trying to outdo her siblings to be the best 
at being ill. Um, and this is why, as I say, Austin often turns a kind of a sceptical and satirical eye on those who claim to be ill. And there's a certain phrase that crops up more than once in her writing. And this is this is a phrase, the phrase is about having a term for being ill, a term for being like a nap or a talent. So it's there in her letters, in her one letter, which refers to her brother, Henry. She says, dear Henry, dearest Henry, what a term he has for being ill. And it's there in her fiction as well. So this is with reference to Arthur Parker, and again, in Sanderton. Arthur Parker has such a term for being ill. So I guess a turn is like a, a, a knack or a talent. And I think Austin's implication is that if you have a talent for being ill, if you can get good at being ill, then does that really count as illness? So that's there's that kind of diagnostic scepticism that I think you get continually when Austin looks at those who claim to be ill. However, I think the picture is, is, is slightly more complex than that. I don't think that Austin is quite simply responding with cold-blooded scepticism when people claim to be ill. So for example, her hypochondriacs aren't always wrong. In, in Emma, Mrs. Churchill does, does die in the end. So again, she is one of these, the rare example of a minor character who expires in the course of a Jane Austen novel. So that leaves us in a, in a slightly uncomfortable position that if we've been sneering at Mrs. Churchill, if, if we've been calling her bluff and thinking that it's all, it's all attention seeking nonsense, then that puts us in quite an ethically and morally uncomfortable position because actually there was illness there, certainly at the very end. I think one thing Austin's also drawing our attention uh, to as well, when she thinks about how people imagine illness is, how else are we going to know about the interiority of other people in the absence of x-rays and biopsies, how else are you going to get any kind of grasp of the, of the medical well-being of friends and neighbours and people in your community? So there's a lot of talk in, in Emma in relation to Jane Fairfax and in Mansfield Park in relation to Tom Bertram. There's a lot of talk about these characters' lungs, about their pulmonary health. And that, that medical gossip, I guess it's I guess it's 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 voyeuristic and it's indiscreet as gossip often can be, uh, but what it represents is a, is an attempt to exteriorize interiority, that there's something there in the other person that we can't see, that we can only visualize it imaginatively, and it's only through medical gossip that it can become something like an object of shared knowledge. Finally, uh, in on the on the theme of imagining illness, I think one thing that's very interesting about Austin's treatment of this theme is that it's not simply a case of people imagining illnesses in themselves and claiming in this moment to be ill, but they're also very fond, I think, many of her characters of imagining the illnesses that might be. So I think that there is a pre predictive or a preemptive quality to gestures of imaginative diagnosis in Austin's, uh, in Austin's work. Um, the example I'm going to give of preemptive or predictive diagnosis is, is quite a comical one, as you're about to see, but I think that doesn't undermine, I think, the, the intricacy and the seriousness of what Austin does with it. Uh, I want to talk about the fears that circulate in her, this is her longest and most intricate and in many ways her most perfect novel, Emma, but there are terrible fears that circulate in Emma about the risk of catching cold. And those fears are articulated with particular anxiety by Emma's father, Emma Woodhouse's father, Mr. Woodhouse, who is, he's elderly, he's doddery, and he's this neurotic fusspot who never stops worrying about other people's health. So here are some examples. So this is Mr. Woodhouse talking about Emma's friend, Harriet Smith. And he says, she seems to be sitting out of doors with only a little shawl over her shoulders, and it makes one think she must catch cold. So this is this is imagining the illness to come. So this is a predictive or preemptive anxiety coming from uh, Mr. Woodhouse. What makes this particularly comical, this moment as well, is Mr. Woodhouse is here talking about a picture of Harriet. He's talking about the portrait. So he's so worried about illness that he, he, it's almost as though he thinks even a two-dimensional representation of a human being will somehow 
catch cold. So he's worried about Harriet, but not just about Harriet. He's worried about Mr Knightley. I wish, I wish you may not catch cold. He says that of Mr Knightley. Mr Knightley is 37 or 38. He's in robust health. He really doesn't need looking after by, by Mr Woodhouse, but Mr Woodhouse is, is fretting about him all the same. But it's not just Harriet, it's not just Mr Knightley he's worried about, he's worried about Frank Churchill as well. And he has very genuine unmixed anxiety to know that, that he, that Frank Churchill, had certainly escaped catching cold. Frank Churchill is 23, he's in robust health. Again, he doesn't really need this fussing, but, but here it is. And, and finally, this is, this is what Mr Woodhouse says when word gets out that, that his daughter and her friends have hatched an idea to have an informal dance at a friend's house. So when you have a dance, you open the doors, you open the windows, the air gets in, and clearly Mr Woodhouse has this kind of, once again, has this medical paranoia that people are going to suffer uh, if, if they have this dance. So he says, Emma is not strong. She would catch a, a dreadful cold. So would poor little Harriet. So would you all. So that even in that short sentence, it's almost like a, an outbreak narrative or a contagion narrative from Emma to Harriet to the entire community. Everyone is going to catch cold. So, th so there is this obviously a very comical quality to, to his neurotic fussing about the, the health of, of young, robust, fairly healthy people. Um, but what else can we say here? I think a couple of things we can say. It's not necessarily, I suppose, in an era before antibiotics and mass vaccination and penicillin and so forth, is perhaps not as comical as it may seem now to have anxiety about how a cold might escalate and become much more serious. Um, one thing we can also say is that I think it's really clear that we're dealing with the case of projection, that when um, when Mr Woodhouse is talking about Harriet, when he's talking about Mr Knightley, when he's talking about Frank Churchill, when he's talking about all of them, he's talking about himself, that he's projecting onto the younger generation anxieties about his own fragile health as he, as he sees it. And I think another thing we can say here as well is that, that when Mr Woodhouse talks about illness, he's not just talking about illness. When he talks about catching cold, he's not just talking about catching cold. I think what's coming through here is a cer certain set of, 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 let's call them cultural or social fears and anxieties about the younger generation and, and what they represent in terms of mobility and dynamism and change. So they're going to have a ball. What happens when young people get together and they have a ball? They dance, they flirt, they fall in love, they get married. It just represents this unpredictability that Mr Woodhouse, who is an extraordinarily conservative character, has a deep-seated fear of change. He cannot deal with it, he cannot process it, and he almost cannot directly confront it. So he pathologizes change by thinking about it as a kind of medical disorder, which is, if they're not curved, we're going to run riot through the younger generation. Um, so at this point, I'm beginning to think of, of illness operating on at least two levels. In Austin, clearly, there are people who physically, medically, anatomically, physiologically get ill and get unwell. But illness is almost all, always also operating as a trope. Uh, and, I, and I want to begin to think maybe a little bit more about that as I move on to my, to my final slides. Something that I find very interesting, I think, in, in Austin is, is there seems to be an implication at times in her novel that illness can be good for you, that illness can make you a better person. So one example would be Tom Bertram in Mansfield Park. Tom Bertram is, is Sir, uh, Sir Thomas Bertram's eldest son. He is the heir to Mansfield Park, but his behaviour is dissolute disreputable and irresponsible. He's fond of drinking, gambling, spending time with friends. He seems to be a very unserious person until he uh, undergoes a very, very serious bout of fever. And when he recovers from this bout of fever, he seems to be a transformed character. So the, the, the narrator at this point says that Tom is the better forever for his illness. So illness, what is bad for you medically, the suggestion here is what is bad for you medically can be good for you morally. Something comparable happens in Sense and Sensibility, where you have Marion Dashwood, 
who is very much a, a fully paid up member of the cult of senses of the cult of sensibility who i guess overvalues feeling and imagination and undervalues good sense she like tom bertram undergoes very serious uh, you know life threatening illness when she recovers from it she says my illness has made me think my illness has made me think so it's as though she has been disciplined and even punished by illness so illness here obviously it's operating physiologically but it's also operating ideologically to regulate the behavior of transgressive characters in austin's world and i think and again i'm thinking of illness more uh, more sort of uh, figuratively here i think there are characters like Catherine Morland in Northanger Abbey and Emma Woodhouse in Emma, who enjoy very good health, but they have overactive imaginations. Emma, in a, in, a, in, a, in a novel full of medical anxiety, Emma Woodhouse, Austin's heroine, she, she seems to be almost indestructible. She never gets ill. But her one flaw in this novel is this imagination. And the novel is about her being being almost cured of that overactive imagination. So I think that novel is inviting us to think of Emma's journey as a kind of therapeutic journey and she needs to sort of be cured of the, the, the disease or the malaise of imagination in the way that Catherine Morland, I think, in similar ways is cured of her overactive, gothicized imagination in Northanger Abbey. Um, to sum up then, I'm, I'm just going to sum up with some comments that I hope pull together some threads that, that have been running through this, this, this brief talk. So Jane Austen seems to me to be a writer who takes a satirical view of those who imagine that they are ill. But there are times when she undermines confident distinctions between imagined and non-imagined illness. So Mrs Churchill in Emma would be a case, a case in point. And I think she does appreciate that our relationships with present and future states of bodily health are in significant ways mediated by the imagination. Um, although at times her work seems to imply that the imagination is itself a kind of illness that could be applied to Marion Dashwood or to Emma Woodhouse, characters with excess sensibility or excess imagination, and finally, there are times when Austin even seems to tout illness itself as a cure for imagination. There are times when imagination is bad for you in Austin and illness is the necessary cure. Um, OK, thanks very much indeed for listening, everyone. And I will stop there and see if I can unshare my screen. Thank you very much, Dr. Greeny, for your thought-provoking, very lucid uh, presentation, and also for your fresh perspective. I was taking loads of notes, and many things made perfect sense for me now uh, when I compare different things. Thank you very much. Thank you.